Hello, seniors. It's been a while, and I'm glad to see you all again. Another journey is yet to overcome. Let's step ahead in learning another exciting area of science that concerned with the study of inanimate natural objects, including physics, chemistry, astronomy, and related subjects. Students, it's time to learn physical science. Class, our lesson today, Polarity of Molecules. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to differentiate polar and nonpolar bands, determine the polarity of chemical bands between atoms using the concept of electronegativity, familiarize with the different shapes of molecules, and explain how polarity of bonds and molecular geometry affects the polarity of molecules. Covalent is a bond formed through sharing of electrons. It exists between both nonmetals, which are highly electronegative compared to metals. Due to the different or similar number of valence electrons of combining atoms, the resulting molecule may exhibit polarity. Polarity refers to the way in which atoms bond with each other. When atoms come together in chemical bonding, they share electrons. A polar molecule arises when one of the atoms exerts a stronger attractive force on the electrons in the bond. The electrons get drawn more towards that atom so that the molecule exhibits a slight charge imbalance. There are two factors that determine the polarity of molecules. These are 1. The polarity of the bonds between atoms which can be studied based on electronegativity and 2. The geometrical shape of the molecule which can be predicted via the valence shell electron pair repulsion or the VSEPR theory. The polarity of a band is determined by a periodic concept called electronegativity. Electronegativity is an expression of an atom's tendency to attract electrons in a chemical bond. In order to determine the polarity of a band, you must find the difference in the electronegativities of the atoms involved. Take a look at the electronegativity values of some elements in the figure shown. What have you noticed? The electronegativity increases from left to right of a period and decreases from top to bottom of a group. Take note also that the higher the value of En or electronegativity, the element tends to attract electron towards itself. So what is the connection of electronegativity to the polarity of bands? We could use the electronegativity values of the atoms involved to get the absolute electronegativity difference which will help us in predicting what type of chemical bond, whether ionic, polar covalent, or non-polar covalent, would exist between them. If the difference is between 0.4 and 1.7, the bond will be polar. If the difference is greater, the bond will have an ionic character. This means that electrons will be taken from the less electronegative element and spend all of their time orbiting the more electronegative element. If the difference in the electronegativities is smaller than 0.4, the bond will be nonpolar covalent. This means that electrons will be shared equally between the atoms and the bond will not have a polar character. For example, you are asked to predict what type of band is present between the following pairs of atoms by determining their electronegativity difference. 1. Calcium and Chlorine 2. Chlorine and Chlorine 3. Hydrogen and Chlorine The first step is to get the electronegativity values of the given atoms. You may find these electronegativity values in your periodic table of elements. 
And after getting the electronegativity values of these atoms, get the difference. For example, in calcium and chlorine, 1.0 and 3.0 electronegativity values respectively, then we can get their difference. 1.0 minus 3.0 is negative 2.0. Get the absolute value of negative 2.0. That will yield 2.0 electronegativity difference. And we will go back to the table. Okay, The type of bond with 2.0 electronegativity difference will fall under ionic bond. Correct. Okay, In chlorine and chlorine case, they have the same electronegativity value of 3.0. Their difference, obviously, is 0. Therefore, it is a nonpolar covalent bond. For hydrogen and chlorine, 2.1 and 3.0 electronegativity values, 2.1 minus 3.0 will yield negative 0 0.9. And the absolute value of that number is 0 0.9. Using the table again as a reference, 0 0.9 electronegativity difference will mean polar covalent bond. Nonpolar molecules have an electronegativity difference of less than 0 0.5. It is symmetrical, having usual molecular shapes of linear, tetrahedral, or planar. Polar molecules have an electronegativity difference of greater than 0 0.5. It is asymmetrical, having usual molecular shapes of bent. However, there is a possibility that the bond is nonpolar based on electronegativity difference, but the molecule as a whole is polar based on its molecular shape. A polar covalent bond is formed when electrons are shared unequally by two atoms in a compound. The bonded pair of atoms form an electric dipole represented by the symbol. Dipole means two poles, which means that a molecule has one positive end and one negative end. In this type of bond, the atom with the higher electronegativity value becomes the partial negative pole, symbolized as shown, while the atom with the lower EN value becomes a partially positive. Always bear in mind that the direction of the arrow is always pointing from a more electropositive pole to the more electronegative pole. Take hydrogen fluoride, for example. Hydrogen has higher EN than fluorine. Thus, the direction of the arrow is pointing away from H and towards F. There is an equal electron density as represented by the size of the circle. On the other hand, a nonpolar covalent bond develops if both atoms equally share a pair of electrons between them. This occurs when the bonding atoms have approximately equal EN value or equal ability to attract electrons to each other. Nonpolar covalent bond is an example of bond formed when two chlorine atoms combine. The next question is, how about for those molecules consisting of more than two atoms, like dihydrogen oxide, carbon tetrachloride, nitrogen trihydride, and carbon dioxide. For polyatomic molecules, both the bond polarity and molecular shape determine the overall molecular polarity. In terms of molecular geometry, the valence shell electron pair repulsion or the VSEPR theory would help us to determine the spatial arrangement of atoms in a polyatomic molecule. You can predict the shape or molecular geometry of a substance using the following steps. Step 1. Determine the central atom of a molecule. The central atom is the least electronegative element. Step 2. 
draw the appropriate Lewis dot structure for the molecule. Step 3. Count the number of bonding pairs of electrons and non-bonding or lone pairs around the central atom. Step 4. Determine the electron pair orientation using the total number of electron pairs. And step 5. Identify the shape of the molecule based on the location of the atoms. For detailed application of these steps, let's watch this. After you've mastered how to write electron dot formulas on a piece of paper, which is a flat sheet and we're kind of limited to the two-dimensional world, you have to really start thinking about how molecules really look in a three-dimensional world because that's the world that molecules actually live in. The simplest model for modeling this type of behavior, and it actually works rather well, is called the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And the name's probably scarier than it actually is as far as it works. We often just call it the VSEPR theory, and then we kind of just say it all together, VSEPR theory. So you'll hear me say VSEPR theory from now on when I mean the previous. So the way it works, and the name kind of gives it away, is you take your electron dot formula and you simply count electron regions around the central atom, and you realize that each of those regions is a negatively charged region. And so it's going to repulse all the other negatively charged regions, and they're going to try to get away from each other. They can't completely get away, though, because the nucleus of the central atom is holding them in. So what they do is they try to get away from each other, but they're still held by the central atom. This leads to distinct molecular shapes. And the easiest one is two regions. If you only have one atom on one side and one on the other, and they try to get away from each other, you get a fairly linear type um, molecule. And so that's the first one. Two regions gives you linear shape. The bond angle is 180. Stepping up to the next one, three regions. You count the regions around the central, there's three. If three regions try to get away from each other, you basically get a nice kind of pie shape. It's like taking a pie and cutting it into perfect thirds. So you get a 120 degree angle all the way around for those three regions. Both of those regions are still planar. They still look just fine on a sheet of paper. It's when you get to four regions that you have to go to the third dimension. You have to go three-dimensional. And what this gets you is a shape that we call a tetrahedron or tetrahedral geometry. It's four regions around a central, all perfectly symmetric. And if you take a look and spin the molecule around and look at it, every region is equivalent. And the bond angles are now down to 109.5 degrees. That's a tetrahedral geometry. So as you can see, the bond angles are getting smaller because we're bringing in more regions. We started at 180 for linear, 120 for trigonal planar. Now we're down to 109.5 for tetrahedral. So that really sums up most of what we will use, especially in organic chemistry. Now, in addition to those, you can have expanded octets, which gets you five and six regions. So to handle those, you got to go one step further. Uh, the five regions is a little bit complicated, but it's really just a combination of two and three. You're going to have two atoms linear, and then the other three are going to be trigonal planar perpendicular to that. When you look at the shape, you see what we call a trigonal bipyramid. We call it a bipyramid because you can look at the pyramid going up to the top atom and down to the bottom atom. Those are two little pyramids pointing in opposite directions. That's trigonal bipyramid. The last one is six regions. And when you get up to six regions, you get something that should look somewhat familiar if you've ever studied X, Y, Z coordinate planes and coordinate uh, points. Everything's 90 degrees apart or 180. It's like the X, Y, and the Z axis of three-dimensional space. You put one atom in each space, you get six total. Bond yeah. angles are either 90 or they're 180. You might go, why is it octahedral when there's six? Well, if you close up, if you take every point and make a line, you get a closed three-dimensional object with 
a total of eight sides. Eight-sided enclosed figure is an octahedron, and so we call it an octahedral geometry. So those are the other two that are part of Vesper theory. When you put all five of those together, you've got all five of what we call our electronic geometries around a central atom. And that is at the heart of Vesper theory. That's the end of our lesson today. It's been my pleasure teaching you one of the amazing topics of physical science, and I really hope you learned something from this video lesson. Thank you, and may God bless us all. Let's meet again in our next video.